to be at Gateway tonight with Pastor Robert and his gracious wife, Debbie, at this beautiful and majestic Gateway Church. Those of you who attend the Gateway Churches are privileged and highly favored of God to have this esteemed man of God and his wife as your spiritual shepherd. You owe them your love, your loyalty, and your prayers that their lives and this church will continue to be a godly example to this nation about what's possible when people work together for the glory of God. When, I'm going to a city that's set on a hill Its ruler and maker is the Lord God above Oh, I'm going to a city and it's set on a hill And someday I'll be in heaven and there'll be no sorrow there to a city, it lies four square, the gates are made of jasper, and I'll see Jesus there. Hello, everybody. We have a very sobering program for you today. We're going to be discussing the downfall of Robert Morris from Gateway Church, and his victim, was a 12-year-old girl who he was molesting for over four and a half years, over a hundred times. It's a very, very sobering story. And I'll be playing some newspaper articles and some very excellent reporting from the Warburg Watch. They originally broke the story last week on Friday, I believe, last Friday. Within four days of the story breaking, it went viral all around the world and was picked up by the New York Times, CNN, CBS, NBC, the UK papers. And on Tuesday, Robert Morris resigned as the pastor of Gateway Church. He was then removed from many of the television networks because, after all, you don't want to feature a pedophile on your network. So even though they were giving praises to some of the networks for taking him off, what are you going to do? You're going to play this guy's programs? I don't think so. So if, you're lo if your local station or one of your stations is still playing his programs, please call them. And let them know what happened and ask them to please not play his programs anymore. And also his website, his church website there, Gateway, they shouldn't be playing his sermons. They still have his sermons up there. No, people don't want to see his sermons anymore. No. No. So please just go away and uh, don't come back. Who's going to take over this? these churches? They have, I think, over nine locations, and he had a big television ministry, book sales, and that's finished. Uh, he was on radio, YouTube, whatever. So I don't know who's going to take over. He was trying to groom his son to take over for him, which I hope none of the, the this ministry, if it does survive, which I don't know if it will, it shouldn't go to the family. They should really close the place up and just disband it. It wasn't, it wasn't founded by God. They, they, on their program today, they were trying to say that it was God started this ministry. No, God didn't start that ministry. No, he didn't. He didn't start it with somebody that was an unrepentant pervert who uh, acknowledged that he had 
an indiscretion with a young lady, which he didn't, even trying to cover it up last week and lie. And the church put out a statement that it was a young lady when it was a 12-year-old girl. And then they didn't, after they found out there, they didn't even fire him. They let him resign. So what kind of an elder board is that? If you don't even have the courage to stand up for what's right, you don't belong in the ministry either. It's worried about your paychecks or your, your uh, IRAs or whatever. The place was founded on extortion and excess. As Jesus said in Matthew 23:25 Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter but within you are full of extortion and excess and that was Robert Morris preaching on his phony tithing scams which I've said it before if you if you're going to teach the bible please read it because he was always trying to get people to to tithe 10% of their income because they had to, because God said they had to, and God never said that anybody had to ever tithe money. And the church is not the storehouse either because nobody's bringing produce to the storehouse over there. Anyway, it wasn't built by God because God doesn't build things that way through dishonesty. He builds things through integrity and holiness and purity. And this man was not any of those at all. So please go to the Wartburg Watch and read the excellent reporting. We thank God for Dee Parsons and Todd Wilhelm who broke the story there. Who listen to Cindy, and it, it was God's timing because it went all over the world. There was, no, there was no coming back for Robert Morris. When God decides he's going to judge you, look out because it's going to happen, and it's going to happen in a big way. And... He has to do it because God is concerned about his church. And he doesn't like people coming and taking advantage of children and taking advantage of women and taking advantage of the sheep. No, God doesn't like it. And so if you keep on doing it and you don't repent and you don't tell the truth, he will make sure that the truth comes out one way or another. And so Robert Morris found that out. And we want to thank Cindy Clemisher. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right, but for her courage to speak out because it did take courage for her to tell her story. And God honored it. God honored it. And her abuser is now gone from public ministry. And I hope never to come back again. So I'm going to play some of these clips for you. This story really has kept me up at night. And last night, especially after I saw the story NBC News put out yesterday about Robert Morris 
threatening Cindy in 2005 that if she that if he gave her money to get counseling she could be criminally charged this man is evil that's evil it it just gave me the creeps i was tossing and turning just thinking about how evil that was after over a hundred times that he molested her throughout the years of her, between 12 and 16. Then he threatens her with criminal prosecution. He threatens her. I mean, well, he's a national figure on the scene. It, it just, it, it was just totally creepy and evil. And you say, how do people like this get so famous and rich and powerful and uh, people are listening to them preach the gospel and they're so evil? Oh, it, it really disturbed me, which I'm sure it disturbed a lot of people. And it's still, we're still disturbed. And there's been some great reporting. If you go over to X. Of course, we know that was formerly Twitter. There's been great reporting there. You, there's a little search hour, uh, and you could put in Robert Morris, and it brings up so many of the great Twitter fre uh, threads there. People have been digging up newspaper stories of Robert Morris from the 1980s to prove when they're lying, who's lying. Great work by brothers and sisters in Christ who are totally disgusted and hurt by, by the actions of Robert Morris. And then the way it was handled after, it was, it's been very upsetting for all of us. Very upsetting. So... I'm going to play first this audio from Wade Burleson, and you can also see his wonderful, informative Twitter threads there, or X threads, and see some of his comments there on the Wartburg watch. And he knows Cindy personally. And he also knows James Robeson. Robeson. I'm still trying to figure out how to pronounce his name. Excuse me for mispronouncing if I do, but... This, this is a very sobering comment of his on the Wartburg watch. I called and left a message for James Robison about whether he knew her age, and other questions. I've not heard back. The struggle I have with his answer on this video, I didn't not know, is twofold. 1. James issued a press release stating he hired Robert Morris, in the late 80s, and that after the sexual immorality was discovered, Robert left full-time ministry from Shady Grove Church, for two years. James is not being truthful in that press statement. Newspaper articles show James hired Robert Morris in December 1981, one year before the abuse began, and during the abuse, Robert Morris was working as a James Robison Crusade associate evangelist. How could the boss not know the details of his associate evangelist's immorality? By the way, I'm not saying he did know her age, I'm just saying that I would think he should know, and, even more importantly, see if he wasn't being truthful I know truthful James said he didn't James know her Robinson age in the video, hired Robert, but he also said why Robert should we Morris believe him wasn't on? working I didn't for him know the when age all this happened, a false statement that has been demonstrably proven to be false. Even worse, shortly after Robert stepped out of ministry, in 1987 because of his sexual immorality, he was once again traveling for James Robison crusades very quickly. Now, get this, Robert went overseas, the Philippines, where blind eyes are made to see, and deaf ears are opened, when over 500 Filipinos came to faith in Christ, that's from a 1988 Louisiana newspaper ad about Robert. 
there was no two-year restoration process. If we are to believe Robert Morris in his book, there seems to have been one month removal from ministry. One month. Robert says it was to deal with my pride. Nothing about the crime of molesting a child. Without Al Gore having yet to invent the internet in 1987, lol, it seems everybody involved with Robert Morris, people who loved him, sincerely hoped nobody in Oklahoma would find out what Robert Morris was doing overseas or in American schools and churches after his one-month removal. CB, I know you to be a man of integrity. Truth matters to you. I'm not saying James Robison did know the girl's age. Steve LeBlanc, a former Gateway staff member and current pastor of Sherman Bible Church, disagrees with me and adamantly says James did know the details. I'm waiting for confirmation. But I must admit, I'm having a hard time reconciling James's deception on other issues as I hear him say on the video that he did not know the nature of Robert's crime. As you know, even in 1987, there were mandatory reporting laws in Texas for ministers, and James Robison was a licensed minister from Texas. There's every reason for James to say he didn't know. 2. I'll keep this one short. The childhood of Cindy Clemishier was stolen. Even worse, in adulthood, some issues in her life, emotional, spiritual, psychological, and relational, crop up because a grown married man in gospel ministry, a husband with a son of his own, graphically, repeatedly, and horrifically stole Cindy's sexual purity from age 12 to 17. There can be, will never be, any justification for what Robert Morris did. Many people knew of Robert's immorality, Debbie, his wife, a woman who informed Cindy's parents, a friend of Cindy's family and now a licensed counselor to whom I've sent a private message about James Robison, Olin Griffin, pastor of Shady Grove, James Robison, and more. Again, everyone who loves Robert Morris and knew in 1987 that Cindy was 12 when the abuse began, has every advantage in 2024 for saying they did not know. If they did know, and declare they did today, they would be confessing to helping Robert cover a crime. One would not expect anyone to admit in 2024 that they knew, look at the statement of the elders. I expect nothing less. Jesus told his followers to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. I am trying to be gentle in this whole mess, even though I want to strangle some people who abused Cindy. God's grace helps me because Rochelle, my wife, and I know Cindy to be a strong, vibrant believer in Jesus who understands the power of forgiveness. But we, God's people, should be wise as serpents. We trust the saints but verify the stories. It's that simple. Cindy agrees with me that the reason this entire sordid mess should be public is to make every perp who even thinks about stealing the sexuality of a child stop in his, or her, tracks, because they remember what happened to Robert Morris. Thanks, C.B. Scott. Thank you for all you do in caring for others, for your love for foster children, and for your love for truth. James Robison has been a family friend for decades, working with my father at Fullness Magazine and Jack Taylor, Jim Hilton, and other great men of the kingdom. But as I told James' assistant, I just have a few questions for him to help gauge the truth-telling. Friendship takes a back seat to the truth when it comes to child abuse. I have no confirmation yet that James Robison knew Robert Morris' victim was a minor. If that evidence comes forth from the testimony of two or three people who were there and know who knows, including the young woman who helped Cindy tell with her parents, now a licensed counselor, then James Robison should lose his ministry as well. He who hopefully waits on me will never be put to shame. Isaiah 49 verse 23 Amen to that. We'll see what James knew and what he didn't know. Of course, he's put out a statement. And he's not denying he knew the age of Robert Morris's victim. We'll see, though. We'll see. Because it, everything's going to come out. It's, it's going to come out. So don't hide. And James has 68 million, 68 million reasons why 
he would try to protect himself because his ministry take, took in $68 million, $60 million. He's taking in big, big money. He has a private jet. He's got some nice houses. Uh, don't rock the boat over there. Don't rock the boat. So we'll see. But if, if he is complicit in this, it's going to come out because there's people that know. There's people that know things and they will come forward. So we'll see. We'll see who's, who's uh, telling the truth and who isn't. Even the, I, I have a video that I just put up about James and his water wells. Uh, he takes in $68 million, and then he does these commercials, which I show in the video, where we need, we're going to put up 350 wells this year, and it's $4,800 a well. So that, don't, that doesn't even come to $2 million. And yet he's got $68 million to spend. Oh, it, these people, they get too big, they get too rich, and they get too arrogant. But James, James uh, also had his problems with having affairs. Here's some newspaper articles. Leaders of TV evangelist James Robeson's ministry are quietly trying to deal with reports that Robeson had an extramarital affair 10 years ago. Robeson, 46, who is married and has three children, repented, and the matter was handled in a Christian way at that time, said the Reverend Jack Taylor of Fort Worth, who has been a spiritual counselor for the evangelist and for the woman. Sources said Robeson, one of the nation's best-known TV evangelists, and the woman, now in her late 20s, reportedly became involved while she was single, employed by the evangelist ministry and temporarily living with Robeson and his wife. Robeson is one of the nation's best-known TV evangelists. His broadcasts are aired on more than 100 stations in the United States and Canada from his ministry's headquarters in Euless, a city between Dallas and Fort Worth. The woman whose identity the Star Telegram is withholding is married and lives in San Antonio, sources said. She could not be reached for comment. Taylor said the matter resurfaced recently, apparently because the woman still had some emotional problems dealing with what had happened. Yeah, I'm sure she had emotional problems because she was staying with James and Betty and then he started molesting her. I'm sure she had emotional problems. If you want to read these articles, they're online. And this did happen many years ago. If you put in the search... James Robison Affair, it'll come up and you can see it. Here's another article. Unsurprisingly, Robison was also involved in extramarital sex. I came across this article from the New York Times, originally published in July 1990. If you do the math, Robison was 36 when his extramarital sex came to light. The woman would have been in her late teens. I take this to mean anywhere from 17 to 19 years old. There is a strong possibility that Robison was having sex with a minor and it came to light in 1980, a mere two years before Morris' sexual abuse of a minor. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 43.29 says, The Lord is terrible and very great and marvelous in his power. And Robert Morris is finding out just how terrible the Lord can be. They're finding out. But you could see the, the uh, stories at the Wartburg Watch and Todd Wilhelm has put up the story, James Robison and Robert Morris, two peas in a pod, March 27th, 2024, episode of Life Today, host James Robison speaks with guest Robert and James Morris, reveals gateway church leadership to remain in the family. I hope not. No, it shouldn't remain in the family at this point. But we'll see what happens. 
We'll see what happens with the great and terrible God. I'm going to play this article for you from NBC that was put up. NBC.com put it up last night. And it really disturbed me. Thinking about how cruel this man and his wife, Debbie, and she knew the age of the, of, uh, the child at the time. When he got found out back in the 1980s, when he got found out, and then his, he was married at the time, and then his wife found out, and she stayed with him. I don't understand that because they had children. And she covered for him all these years. They're both sick. He's sick and she's sick too. Here's the first part of the story. Two decades before Pastor Robert Morris publicly confessed last week to engaging in sexual behavior with a child and resigned from Gateway Church in South Lake, Texas, his accuser had confronted him and sought compensation, according to copies of emails obtained by NBC News. 23 years after you began destroying my life, I am still dealing with the pain and damage you caused, Cindy Clemishier, 35 at the time, wrote to Morris on September 20, 2005 according to partially redacted emails provided to NBC News by her attorney. I want some type of restitution. Pray about it and call me. Morris responded two weeks later. Debbie and I really do care for you and we sincerely want God's best for you, he wrote, referring to his wife, Debbie Morris, according to the emails. Robert Morris wrote that he'd long ago confessed his sins to Clemishier's father and believed that he'd obtained your forgiveness as well as your family's. Morris ended his reply with a legal warning. My attorney advises that if I pay you any money under a threat of exposure, you could be criminally prosecuted and Debbie and I do not want that, he wrote. If you need more information, have your attorney contact mine. Morris' email was the final exchange in a series of messages that year between Clemishier, Morris and a former Gateway elder, Clemishier said. The emails, spanning from April to October 2005, appear to reveal Clemishier's attempts to get Morris, who later rose to become a leading evangelical figure who served on former President Donald Trump's spiritual advisory panel, to compensate her for the trauma she says he inflicted on her as a child. Men that have over 100 counts of child molestation go to prison, Clemishier wrote to Morris in one of the messages. Men who pastor churches that have over 100 counts of child molestation go to prison and pay punitive damages. You have not had to do either. Shocking, isn't it? Shocking. This man was a pastor and a supposed spiritual leader, and he's threatening the woman he victimized with prosecution. At the urging of a retired pastor, Clemishier went public with her allegations against Morris last week in a post published by the Wartburg Watch, a website focused on exposing abuse in churches. In the post and in a subsequent interview with NBC News, Clemishier accused Morris of molesting her for years beginning at her home in Oklahoma on Christmas night in 1982, when she was 12. Morris hasn't been charged with a crime. He didn't respond to a request for comment. Last weekend, Morris and Gateway's elders initially responded to Clemishier's allegations by acknowledging in statements that Morris had several sexual encounters with a young lady when he was in his 20s and saying he had been transparent about his sin and had repented. On Tuesday, following days of backlash from church members and elected officials, Gateway's board of elders announced it had accepted Morris' resignation. The elders' prior understanding was that Morris's extramarital relationship, which he had discussed many times throughout his ministry, was with a young lady and not abuse of a 12-year-old child, the church leaders said in their statement. Clemishier and her lawyer, Boz Chavigian, 
contend that Gateway elders should have long ago investigated Morris' account of a consensual relationship. Gateway officials did not immediately respond to a message requesting comment. The Board of Elders announced this week it had hired a law firm to investigate the matter. He 2005 emails reveal that at least one Gateway Church elder, Tom Lane, was aware that Clemishier had been in touch with Morris and seeking compensation. The emails do not indicate, however, whether Lane, who has since left the church, was aware that Clemishier was accusing Morris of child sexual abuse. The initial email Clemishier sent is missing from the chain shared with NBC News, Clemishier's lawyer said she could not locate it. In a statement to NBC News on Friday, Lane said that, until Clemishier went public with her story last week, he did not fully understand the severity and specifics of the sexual abuse she experienced, nor did I know she was 12 years old when the abuse began. Lane's spokesperson, Richard Harmer, said in an email that Lane was under the impression that Clemishier was under 18, but old enough to consent to a sexual relationship with Morris, who would have been in his early 20s. The age of consent in Oklahoma, where the abuse is alleged to have occurred, is 16. I am deeply saddened by the pain Cindy Clemishier has endured and the recent revelations regarding Pastor Robert Morris, Lane said in his statement. My deepest sympathies go out to Cindy, and I pray her suffering is fully recognized and validated. In April 2005, Lane wrote to Clemishier on behalf of Morris, after Clemishier initially reached out in the email that NBC News has not seen. Lane asked to speak with her, and Clemishier replied that she wanted to address the matter with Morris directly. Lane then wrote that he and the other Gateway elders wanted Clemishier to find help and healing. Lane told Clemishier that Morris had been completely open with the elders of Gateway Church about his past and specifically about his indiscretion with you. He said Morris and his wife had treated Clemishier with caring concern but their responses apparently have not brought the healing you seek. The blessed life that Robert writes about in his book and you refer to in your email is not one of perfection but one of submission and obedience to God, something that he has made diligent effort to walk in, both in failure and success, for more than 20 years, Lane wrote to Clemishier. Robert and Debbie have done what they can to help you heal. Our church believes in healing, forgiveness, and restoration of all individuals. We would like to help you find that healing for your life. The emails shared by Clemishier's lawyer do not include a response from her to Lane's message. It's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. This man is answering her. It, this story is so perverted. Covering up, covering up, because we don't want to destroy this kingdom that Robert Morris built. It's diabolical, totally diabolical. Here's the last clip of the story. In a statement, Chavigian, Clemishier's lawyer, questioned why Lane and other Gateway elders didn't investigate Morris' claims. It seems as if it was preferable for them to simply accept his vague narrative instead of seeking the truth regarding a sexual offense perpetrated upon a minor, Chavigian said. The leaders at Gateway had the responsibility to find out what happened and not to blindly accept his words. Five months after Lane's message, on September 9, 2005, Clemishier wrote again directly to Morris. I am giving you one last chance to call me, she wrote. You really have no idea how devastating it will be if you don't. I don't want Tom or anyone else to contact me. This is your issue not his. A week later, Morris wrote to say he was praying about how to respond, and he followed up several days after that to ask what Clemishier wanted. Clemishier wrote back less than two hours later, I have suffered almost my entire life from the emotional damage you inflicted on me. If you want to know what I want, call me. Morris never called, Clemishier said, although she said she did speak briefly with his attorney to discuss setting up a meeting with Morris but never followed up. In his final reply included in the messages shared by Clemishier, Morris told her she was wrong to believe that he'd benefited from keeping secret what happened between them. 
You see the blessings God has poured out on my life and conclude that it is because I have hidden my past, Morris wrote. God does not work that way. He will not be mocked by deceit. Correction, June 21, 2024. 8.29 p.m. Eastern Time A previous version of this article incorrectly described Richard Harmer. He is Tom Lane's spokesperson, not his lawyer. Mike Hicksonbaugh Mike Hicksonbaugh is the author, the investigative reporter that did the story. Imagine the arrogance of Robert Morris saying, God will not be mocked with deceit. You're, you're trying to say that I've acquired all this wealth and fame by covering up my past transgressions. Well, yeah, you did, but God took it away from you in an instant. Yeah, he showed you how great and terrible he could be. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Who would want to stay in a church after knowing that your pastor was a pedophile. Who would, who would want a, a pastor like that? What was wrong with these people over there? Apparently, they, some of them found out in 2005. Why would you stay? Why wouldn't you call an elders meeting and say, we can't have this man here. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The Christian Post also followed up with an article, and they picked up, of course, it was the Wartburg watch that broke the story. And we have to give them all the credit for the wonderful reporting that they did. And then Christian Post picked it up and then it went viral everywhere. And God was broadcasting the matter to everyone. All, everything that they tried to cover up was being uncovered. And the Christian Post, of course, put, uh, picked up the story. They, they, sometimes they report, their reporting is very good, and, and I went over there today to see uh, some reporting, and I see that there's a puff piece on there about Paula White. Okay, you can't be the Christian Post and then do stories about heretics and ungodly people such as Paula White. I personally wrote a biography about Paula White. It's over 200 pages. And you will be shocked at some of the information that's in the book. So why people still accept this woman as a Christian and then she's put on these Christian websites, I don't understand it, but this has to stop because we had charisma, we had different... TV channels and people promoting uh, Robert Morris, even though he was a false teacher and he had a shady past. So we have to be more discerning about who we promote as Christians and who we promote as Christian leaders. So I was a little disappointed today when I went to see this puff piece on uh, Paula White, it's like, no. But anyway, here's the uh, article that they wrote concerning Robert Morris. Despite statements from elders of Gateway Church in South Lake, Texas, and their founding pastor Robert Morris suggesting that he stepped away from ministry for two years to undergo a carefully monitored restoration process following a moral failure, sexually abusing a girl over multiple years in the 1980s beginning when she was 12. He was back in ministry just one month after he was confronted about the abuse. The 62-year-old Morris made the admission in his 2011 book, Dream to Destiny. The description he provides in the book coincides with the timeline of the molestation confirmed by himself, 
his accuser, Cindy Clemeshear, 54, and the elders of Gateway Church. Morris revealed that he got a job with televangelist James Robeson's prayer center a month after he stepped away from ministry in the 1980s after the Lord orchestrated the circumstances for me to step out of ministry. Prior to those circumstances, which he did not disclose in the book, Morris admitted he was struggling with pride, not a sexual attraction to a preteen girl. After a month away from ministry, Morris stated that he felt he had dealt with his pride sufficiently to make a comeback. He said he was having a hard time finding work with the skills he developed as a preacher and had only been able to get hired as a security guard. After a month of working nights as a security guard at Motel 6, I felt I had made great strides toward humility. I decided that perhaps I was ready to return to ministry. So I checked back with James Robeson's ministry to see if they had any job openings. I was happy to discover that they needed a morning supervisor at their prayer center, from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m., Morris wrote. That sure sounded better than the graveyard shift I had been working at the Motel 6. So I took the job. Morris revealed that only 10 months after he became saved at age 19, the now 80-year-old Robison, the founder and president of Life Outreach International, took him under his ministry and quickly made him an associate evangelist. The meteoric rise of his star on the preaching circuit after that, he said, made him prideful. Things had happened pretty fast after I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ at the age of 19. Only 10 months after being saved, I met James Robison, and he asked me to start traveling with him, speaking to junior and senior high school assemblies. So I had not even been a Christian for a year when I began to travel and preach the gospel. Pretty heady stuff for someone so young, and even younger in the Lord, Morris recalled. Though I started out speaking at public schools, it wasn't long before I was preaching at crusades. Eventually, James was even gracious enough to give me a title, Associate Evangelist. Wow, I was only 20 years old, but because of my association with James, I was already involved in television, preaching to large crowds, and even had a title to prove that I was a bona fide evangelist. It seemed to me that the favor of God was on everything I touched. What a destiny lay before me. What could stop me now, he asked. Life Outreach International did not immediately respond to a request for comment from the Christian Post on Monday. After Clemeshire made her abuse by Morris Public last Friday, the megachurch pastor would admit that it was his inappropriate sexual behavior with a young lady that temporarily stopped his ministry. When I was in my early 20s, I was involved in inappropriate sexual behavior with a young lady in a home where I was staying. It was kissing and petting and not intercourse, but it was wrong. This behavior happened on several occasions over the next few years, Morris said in a statement to the Christian Post after Gateway Church was asked about the allegations. In March of 1987, this situation was brought to light, and it was confessed and repented of. I submitted myself to the elders of Shady Grove Church and the young lady's father. They asked me to step out of ministry and receive counseling and freedom ministry, which I did. Since that time, I have walked in purity and accountability in this area, Morris added. In Dream to Destiny, Morris confessed that while being accountable to his wife Debbie and his friends in the area of his sexuality has not been easy, it has proved to be a good and healthy thing. When I decided to make myself accountable to Debbie, we had been married about seven years. I sat her down and said to her, I need to come clean with you about my past. You know that I have an immoral past, but I want to tell you everything about my past. Then I told her everything. Now I have a very bad past, and I thought she would be shocked. I was actually afraid she would leave me. I was afraid she would say, you're a pervert, and then leave he wrote. You were. Morris said when his wife responded with love and compassion he admitted to her that he had a habit of looking and lusting after other women. I told her that I had a habit I needed to break, a habit of looking. And I asked for her help. I made myself accountable to her. I don't want to look, but I need some help, I said. Will you help me? If you see me looking, I want you to pray for me. I want you to talk to me about it. And I want you to call me on it. 
I had no idea how quickly my request would be answered, Morris wrote. Soon after that we took a vacation and were at the swimming pool. Needless to say, that is a very hard place not to look. Sure enough, a lady walked by me, and I was looking. The next thing I knew, Debbie had reached over and pinched me right where no person should ever be pinched, on the back of my arm. She grabbed my skin in a very painful squeeze, looked into my eyes with intense determination and asked with great seriousness in her voice, Do I need to pray for you? Clemishir first told the Wartburg Watch that Morris began sexually abusing her on December 25, 1982, and continued with the abuse for four and a half years after that. When contacted by CP on Saturday, the 54-year-old grandmother confirmed the details in the report but insisted she was no young lady when Morris began abusing her. I'm, of course, just appalled, Clemishir told CP on Saturday about his description of her as a young lady. I was 12 years old. I was a little girl. A very innocent little girl. And he was brought into our home. He and his wife, Debbie, and their little boy, Josh, trusted and preached at the church that my dad helped start and then began grooming all of us to do this, which took me decades to wrap my brain around as an adult, she said. It went on for many years. He says there was no sexual intercourse, but he did touch every part of my body and inserted his fingers into me, which I understand now is considered a form of rape by instrumentation. I was an innocent 12-year-old little girl who knew nothing about sexual behavior. Since his return to ministry after the abuse of Clemishir, Morris went on to start Gateway Church in 2000, which has 100,000 weekly attendees across nine campuses in Dallas-Fort Worth and online. His television program also airs in over 190 countries, and his radio program, Worship and the Word with Pastor Robert, airs in more than 6,800 cities his website says. Morris also serves as Chancellor of the King's University and has written many books, including The Blessed Life, Dream to Destiny, The God I Never Knew, and Grace, period. In their statement to CP, Gateway Church elders said Morris was transparent with them about his past and they believe he has been biblically restored to ministry. Pastor Robert has been open and forthright about a moral failure he had over 35 years ago when he was in his 20s and prior to him starting Gateway Church. He has shared publicly from the pulpit the proper biblical steps he took in his lengthy restoration process, they said. The two-year restoration process was closely administered by the elders at Shady Grove Church and included him stepping out of the ministry during that period while receiving professional counseling and freedom ministry counseling, they said. Since the resolution of this 35-year-old matter, there have been no other moral failures. Pastor Robert has walked in purity, and he has placed accountability measures and people in his life. The matter has been properly disclosed to church leadership. Clemishir told the Wartburg Watch that she and her family first met Morris at a youth revival in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1981 when he was a married, 20-year-old traveling evangelist. She said Morris began preaching at her church regularly on Sundays after he was invited to do a youth revival in her hometown of Hominy, Oklahoma. Her family and the Morises quickly became friends. They were invited into their home and often went on trips together. She detailed how Morris first molested her on Christmas Day in 1982 and warned her to never tell anyone about this because it will ruin everything. Clemishir claims Morris repeatedly abused her in Texas and Oklahoma, and that he often told his wife that he was merely counseling her during the abuse. Though Morris claims Clemishir's father approved of his return to ministry, the survivor disputes his account. My father never ever gave his blessing on Robert returning to ministry. My father told him he's lucky he didn't kill him. I am mortified that he is telling the world my dad gave his blessing. Of course, we forgive because we are called to biblically forgive those who sin against us. But that does not mean he is supposed to go on without repercussions, she said. Morris was never criminally charged for the alleged abuse. Clemishir told the Wartburg Watch that she retained an attorney in 2005 to file a civil lawsuit, but Morris' attorney suggested she caused the abuse on herself because she was flirtatious. 
She said she asked for $50,000 to cover the cost of her counseling stemming from the abuse. She said they offered her $25,000 if she signed a non-disclosure agreement, but she refused. For years, she explained to CP, she has been warning churches and pastors who would listen to her story about Morris because she doesn't believe she's the only one who suffered his abuse. She also argued that he shouldn't be serving in ministry and should step down. I don't think he ever should have been allowed to be in the ministry. We would never allow someone to go teach in a school, work in a daycare or be a doctor if anybody had done these things, Clemisher said. And I have a very difficult time believing I'm the only one. Amen. Amen. It's very sobering, isn't it? Very, very sobering. Dishonest to the end, he was. He had a moral failure with a young lady. As the, the what kind of elder board does he does he have over there? It sounds like a bunch of yes men, because why wasn't he fired? Why did they fire him when they found out that she was twelve? No, he resigns. He resigns. He didn't have a moral failure. He was a pervert. Oh, he was afraid his wife was going to find out he was a pervert. He was a pervert. He was a pervert. I, I don't understand why a wife would stay with a husband that um, uh, was molesting a 12-year-old girl when, when she had children too. Just uh, It doesn't make any sense at all. It, it, and then these two are pastors, yeah, pastors. And so what does Gateway Church do now? Oh, we hired a law firm to investigate. And what kind of a law firm do they hire? Crisis management, crisis management. You don't need crisis management when you tell the truth. Just tell the truth and you don't have to worry about crisis management. You don't have to worry about God's judgment. Crisis management, you need you need a third party investigation. But there is a third party investigation. Yeah, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. They, they uh, claim they're at, oh, they put out a statement there at gate, uh, Gateway. We love you. We love you. No, you, you don't love you. You don't love the people over there, really. No, because you would have told the truth in the first time. You would have fired this guy. And you wouldn't hire a crisis management team. You didn't love the people. You were, you've been extorting money from the people all these years by collecting tithes. And so I don't know how you could stand it, really. I don't, I don't know how the, these, the elder board and the, all these pastors and elders that they have over there, I don't know how, how could you stand it? And when the, the whole ministry wasn't based on truth, this guy was a liar from the beginning, you know, he's writing books about, oh, he suffered from pride. Oh, he had these moral failures. And please. Yeah, I know some people say, well, we've all sinned. Yeah, we all sinned. But I can guarantee you that 99% of the, the born again believers of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ aren't pedophiles that later go into public ministry. So, don't even start with that. <laughs> no. No. But we need to demand more from people in leadership. And it's just not acceptable the way this was dealt with even in the beginning when it, when uh, his pastor first found out. 
back in the 1980s. It wasn't dealt with properly then. So I, I don't give these leaders over there at Gateway right now, I don't give them any credit for the way they've handled it either. And they had their service today, and people were, you know, standing ovation for the speaker. Please, stop. Stop. I, I can't even believe anybody went back there today. But that's our program for today. And I do want to finish this broadcast today. And if there are any people out there that you're listening and you say, yikes, what a mess. Yeah, it is. It is, but it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves us. He's died for us. He's died to give us a brand new life. And sometimes it's not reflected in the way so-called Christians behave. But Jesus is real. And he's a savior, and he can save you today. Whatever pain and suffering you've gone through, maybe you've had a similar experience as Cindy did. But God is there to heal you and to restore you. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to heal you and to give you a brand new life and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Jesus said in the third chapter of John that you must be born again. First, you're born of your mother. And then you must be born again of the Spirit of God. And he can change you. It's a wonder, really, if Robert Morris ever really was born again. But you can be. You can be. God gives you a new life. He puts his life inside of you. He gives you the mind of Christ. He gives you the power to overcome temptation and to be temperate and to live a holy, godly life. So no matter what you see in the press and and you see the failings of human beings, Jesus will never let you down. He gave his life for you. That's how much he loved you. So be encouraged in the Lord. And don't tolerate this kind of thing. If, If this has happened to you or you know it's happening in a church or an assembly where you're at, please come forward and report it, and and don't let these people get away with it. We all need to be a part of cleaning up the church and reforming the church and making it better and making it safer. Amen? God bless. Yeah.
could be 